a pronouncement. The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach, and Damascus is its resting place. For the eyes of humanity and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord, and also against Hamath, which borders it, as well as Tyre and Sidon, though they are very shrewd. Tyre has built herself a fortress. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt of the streets. Listen, the Lord will impoverish her and cast her wealth into the sea. She herself will be consumed by fire. Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. Gaza, too, and will writhe in great pain, as will Ekron, for her hope will fail. There will cease to be a keen in Gaza, and Ashkelon will become uninhabited. A mongrel people will live in Ashdod, and I will destroy the pride of the Philistines. I will remove the blood from their mouths and the abhorrent things from between their teeth. Then they, too, will become a remnant for our God. They will become like a clan in Judah, and Ekron like the Jebusites. I will encamp at my house as a guard against those who march back and forth, and no oppressor will march against them again. For now I have seen with my own eyes. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless cistern. Return to a stronghold, you prisoners who have hope. Today I declare that I will restore double to you. For I will bend Judah as my bow. I will fill that bow with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece. I will make you like a warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will fly like lightning. The Lord God will sound the ram's horn and advance with the southern storms. The Lord of armies will defend them. They will consume and conquer with sling stones. They will drink and be rowdy as if with wine. They will be as full as a sprinkling basin, like those at the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. For they are like jewels in a crown, sparkling over his land. How lovely and beautiful. Grain will make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we live in a world where there are many voices that clamor for our attention, that demand our response, that claim that we owe our allegiance to them. There are the voices of our own lusts and ambitions and pride and selfishness within, and the clamoring voices of the world all around us. So help us please by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit, to hear above the din, the cacophony of competing voices, the clear voice of our Savior saying to us, this is the way, walk in it. Will give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit says to his church. In Jesus' name, amen. Many tall skyscrapers have an observation uh, floor on their, on their highest level, and tourists can pay for an elevator ride to go all the way to the top, and once there, they can marvel at seeing all of the landscape uh, for astonishing distances. Things look different from such a height, and distances shrink to give us a whole new perspective. Uh, in many ways, the prophetic materials of the Old Testament provide that kind of view of the redemptive landscape. The prophet is taken up, as it were, and we go with him to gain a breathtaking view of far distant events. And from that height, Space shrinks, perspective changes. Episodes that are centuries or more apart may seem jammed together. And for this reason, it's not always easy to relate neatly what was seen from on high in such a way that we can definitely see their fulfillment uh, with what transpires here below. Now, up to this point, Zechariah has focused on immediate issues, mainly the, the building of the temple, the restoration of the nation. Uh, but now a different lens is placed on the book. 
And today we leave the theme of the coming kingdom, those visions that we saw in chapters 1 to 6. And we leave the pivotal chapters dealing with true and false religion, the narrative that was in chapters 7 through 8. And we turn our attention to the prophecy of chapter 9, and what is really the first part of the final section of the book, dealing now with the coming king. It's in this section that we find the most explicit references to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we arrive, it's a bit like ascending to the top of a skyscraper because we get to see far into the future. We get to see the whole landscape, as it were, the immediate future facing God's people and well beyond that to the coming of Christ. And even beyond that to the worldwide conquest of God and bringing the nations to bend the knee to the Lord Jesus. Charles Feinberg rightly says, the last six chapters of this prophecy constitute an incomparable treasury of prophetic truth. Well, the main point that I want us to believe this morning, the sermon in a sentence, uh, is this. God's coming will subdue his enemies through his king for his people. God's coming will subdue his enemies through his king for his people. That's what I want us to see this morning. So if you're not there already, turn to Zechariah 9. We'll look at this passage in three parts. In verses 1 through 8, there's a word of judgment on the nations surrounding Israel. And yet, mixed into that message of judgment is a precious promise of grace. God's enemies are both destroyed and delivered. Then in verses 9 through 10, Zechariah explains how these seemingly exclusive themes will be fulfilled together, right? Judgment and grace, wrath and mercy. And Zechariah turns our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. God's king is both savior and sovereign. Then in verses 11 through 17, Our gaze is cast even further into the future. God's people will be his instruments in the cosmic conflict that will mark the dawning and advancing of his kingdom in the world. But more than that, they will also be precious adornments that display his beauty to the world. God's people are both conquerors and crowns. So let's look at the first theme. God's enemies are both destroyed and delivered. Read again with me verses 1 through 8. A pronouncement. The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach, and Damascus is its resting place. For the eyes of humanity and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord, and also against Hamath, which borders it, as well as Tyre and Sidon, though they are very shrewd. Tyre has built herself a fortress. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold, like the dirt of the streets. Listen, the Lord will impoverish her and cast her wealth into the sea. She herself will be consumed by fire. Ashkelon will see it, And be afraid. Gaza, too, and will writhe in great pain, as will Ekron, for her hope will fail. There will cease to be a king in Gaza, and Ashkelon will become uninhabited. A mongrel people will live in Ashdod, and I will destroy the pride of the Philistines. I will remove the blood from their mouths and the abhorrent things from between their teeth. Then they, too, will become a remnant for our God. They will become like a clan in Judah, and Ekron like the Jebusites. I will encamp at my house as a guard against those who march back and forth, and no oppressor will march against them again. For now I have seen with my own eyes. So this third section of Zechariah contains two pronouncements, or often called oracles or or burdens in other translations. You got chapters 9 to 11, that's one big pronouncement, and then chapters 12 to 14 is the other. And so this is a prophecy, a word of the Lord. God's going to come in judgment, But he's also going to come in salvation. Zechariah presents the hope for a coming king, a future Messiah, through whom God will establish his kingdom. That's why the New Testament quotes this section, these five chapters of Zechariah, more than any other Old Testament book after the Psalms. Sorry, it's six chapters. Chapters 9 through 14. And the word of the Lord there in verse 1 is virtually a title for God himself. To say that God's word is against his enemies is to say that God is against them. Right? Guys, God and his word are inseparable. To be confronted by God's word is to be confronted by God himself. And that should make us tremble every time we read the word of God or hear it proclaim. It's an especially serious matter if we are at odds with the Lord rather than at peace with him. The proper way for humans to respond to God expressed there in the second half of verse 1 Almost an under-the-breath comment by Zechariah before he goes on. God's word has been spoken. All men watch expectantly. 
for its fulfillment. All eyes are on the Lord. The warrior God is about to act. And we'll see that he comes to destroy, to deliver, and to defend. Let's take the enemies first. Verses 1 through 6. None are what we might call the big players. These are not the great imperial powers, Assyria and Babylon, that ravaged Jerusalem in the 8th and 6th centuries, nor the Persians, who held sway in Zechariah's own day. Uh, These are the smaller enemies that had troubled Israel in earlier times. The Philistines, represented here by the names of their cities, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and Ashdod, they were a thorn in Israel's side from the judges uh, until their subjugation by David, roughly the 12th to the uh, 10th centuries. Syria, represented by its capital Damascus, was a problem mainly in the 9th century, but also in the 8th. The Phoenician cities of Tyre, Sidon, they never threatened Israel at all. But they're ranked with the enemies of God here because of their pride and their own skill and their wealth. Now all of these, like Israel, had suffered at the hands of Assyria and Babylon. And by the time of this passage, however, all of them were effectively spent forces and no longer posed any serious threat to Israel. And the point of this opening salvo is that when God comes to rule the world, all his enemies will be as these nations are. God's people will no longer have any cause to fear or to envy them. Whether it was money or might, pride or keen, shrewdness or skills, the Lord will overthrow the sources of these nations' security. And so that's the overall point. That's clear. God's enemies will be destroyed. God will hold all of his enemies to account for their sin. Although these nations did not acknowledge the true God, they were nonetheless accountable to him. The Lord has an eye on all humanity. Nothing escapes his knowledge. Nothing escapes his all-seeing eye. These nations had no skills or resources that could withstand God's coming to judge and destroy. So we have here a word of warning for the world. Judgment is coming. So, repent. It may not come immediately when Israel first conquered the land, the conquest stalled. They never did drive out all of their enemies. Judgment upon God's enemies didn't fall at that time, but it will fall, Zechariah says. The Lord will execute judgment, and he will finish the task. Friends, we may think we have gotten away with our sins. Psalm 94, verse 7, depicts the wicked saying, The Lord doesn't see it. The God of Jacob doesn't pay attention. He doesn't know, and no one else will ever know. We're secure in our sins, perhaps. We think ourselves shrewd. We've erected our own fortresses, whether it might be might or money. All this God talk, you know, it amounts to nothing, and it changes nothing. Judgment isn't coming. I can sin, get away with it, too, and turn on religion with the best of them to cover it up. Well, Zechariah warns us here, doesn't he? Judgment may be delayed, but it is coming. Friend, if you're living in rebellion against the Lord today, be, know this. Be sure your sin will catch up with you. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. This is a word of warning for all of us. But then sounds this surprising note in this section dominated by judgment. Another melody begins to play amidst the minor warning keys. There's this promise of extraordinary, undeserved grace. Verse 7. I will remove the blood from their mouths and the abhorrent things from between their teeth. So the Lord will purify them from their unclean and idolatrous habits. And he'll end their vice, not just by way of destruction, but also by way of deliverance. The Philistines, after all, were the uncircumcised par excellence if they can be cleansed by God for his own people, well, then certainly anyone here can be today. Then they, too, will become a remnant for our God. They will become like a clan, or I think a better translation, like a chief in Judah, and Ekron, like the Jebusites. This purified remnant will become leaders among the Lord's people. Philistines will be the big shots in the new covenant community. Ekron will become like the Jebusites. The Jebusites were a group that Israel failed to conquer when they first entered Canaan. And during David's reign, they were simply assimilated into Israel. 
You see what the Lord is saying here. Not everyone will face destruction. Some who deserve to be destroyed will receive deliverance. Not everyone will be judged. Some will be incorporated into the people of God. Receive mercy. Right? Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's not one of us in this room for whom this is not your story. This is my story. This is my song. Right? We did not deserve mercy. We deserve the wrath and the curse and judgment of God. We were exiles, strangers, foreigners to the covenants of promise and the commonwealth of Israel. But God, who is rich in mercy, loved us, united us to Christ, grafted us in, made us part of his people. God conquers either by power or by grace. But one way or another, he conquers. And he also defends. Look at verse 8. I will encamp at my house as a guard against those who march back and forth. And no oppressor will march against them again. For now I have seen with my own eyes. God himself will be the guardian protector. And oppression will be a thing of the past. That, that never again of verse 8 promises that God will bring to an end, once and for all, the conflict between good and evil. In his own time, in his own way, God will bring history to its divinely determined end. And until that day, he says, I will defend my house, my people. I'll do it by destroying and converting my enemies and through my personal protective presence. That's how he eliminates all threats to his people's survival. That's comforting, isn't it? Second Chronicles 16, verse 9, The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. The Lord's eyes are on us for our good, and they ensure our complete preservation. So God's enemies are both destroyed and delivered. And the question that Zechariah 9 really raises for us is, how can it be that both war and peace, wrath and grace, destruction and deliverance sit together so comfortably here? There's this seamless transition, isn't there, from the theme of judgment in verses 1 to 6 to the theme of mercy in 7 to 8. Zechariah doesn't even pause for breath in between the verses. So how do these positive and negative themes come together? And the answer is bound up in verses 9 and 10. God's king is both Savior and sovereign. Look at verse 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. And so the prophet commands Zion, the people of God, to rejoice, because the ideal king is coming. Those first eight verses ringing with this theme of military conquest would lead us to anticipate the words of verse 14, right? The Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will fly like lightning, and so on. That theme of conquest and that picture of the warrior God, they go very well together. But Zechariah doesn't immediately go there, does he? Instead, he goes to Zion's king, humble, and riding on a donkey. It's an image of peacetime rule, not wartime mobilization. And verse 9, undoubtedly, is the best-known verse in Zechariah, and one of the better-known verses of the entire Old Testament. But who is this king seen here riding into Jerusalem amid shouts of rejoicing? All right, it's been God who's been on the move in verses 1 through 8. His progress has been towards Jerusalem. And so it's God himself whom we're expecting to arrive there at this point. But the picture of God himself riding on a donkey is incongruous, to say the least. And furthermore, God is clearly distinguished from the king. God is the speaker, the I of verse 10, who announces the arrival of the king and speaks of him in the third person. He, the king, will proclaim peace to the nations. And so the king is a man, a human being, but a man closely associated with God. And Zechariah has already given us the key to the identity of this king. The king can be none other than the one whose coming was promised in chapter 3. 
and symbolized in the crowning of Joshua, the high priest, in chapter 6, the one whom these earlier chapters spoke of as God's servant, the branch, now makes his entrance as the king, God's chosen ruler and representative. The king is God's Messiah. And he finds fulfillment in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And Zechariah makes six key statements about this king. First, he is the promised king. Right? Your king is coming to you. This goes to the heart of God's covenant promise to David. David's throne was vacant, but the prophet aimed the eye of faith beyond the empty throne toward the sure promise that one of David's sons would occupy the throne forever. The prospect of seeing that king warranted the command to rejoice. This is Zion's king, your king, not King Darius. Gaza would lose her king, but Zion's king would come to her in fulfillment of all of God's promises. Indeed, every one of God's promises is yes in him. And this king is the source of our joy. Second, he is the righteous king. All other kings, whether of Israel or the nations, were fallen and flawed. They reflected God's character only very imperfectly. But this king is the very embodiment of God's righteousness, the perfect representative. This righteousness foretells the positive and active obedience the Lord Jesus performed during his earthly life. In every way, the Lord Jesus satisfied the expectations and demands of the ideal king. His was a glorious righteousness. Jesus is glorious in his submission to the Father. He's glorious in his devotion to God, his commitment to carry out all his good pleasure. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. None so honor the Father as he in his earthly life. His whole earthly existence was marked by a willing obedience to the will of the Father. His was a voluntary righteousness. This he did freely and voluntarily and cheerfully and consistently and increasingly. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Freely, at great cost to himself. He is glorious as our obedient king, being born of woman, born under the law, filling its demands for us. When John the baptizer tried to stop him from being baptized by him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me, Jesus answered him, allow it for now, for, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. His was a representative righteousness. He is glorious in that his obedience is a public one, a representative one for us. It was an obedience and submission, not for himself, but for us. We were obligated and could not and would not. He was not obligated, but he did for us. Glorious as our last Adam. For just as through the first Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. His whole life was a vicarious life, a life lived unto the Father for us, for our sake, rendering to him what we could not and would not. Find a moment where his obedience fails, where sin enters in, and all our salvation dies. Glorious in his submission to his earthly parents and rendering what we as children have not. Glorious as resisting the wiles of the devil in the wilderness. Glorious in his wholehearted commitment to the task the Father has given him. His was a progressive righteousness. He grew in obedience. He progressed from one degree of faithfulness to another, growing in his own faith and dependency and responding to the increasing responsibilities of his maturing manhood. It was a tried and tested obedience. He learned the increasing domains of obedience, as the writer of the Hebrews writes, from the things which he suffered. His was a completed righteousness. Christ came to fulfill the, the law. Listen to his own statement of purpose in Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Don't think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Jesus did not come to set aside the Old Testament. He says that it is abiding as heaven and earth. He's come for a different purpose, to fill up the law and the prophets. He came to fill up the Old Testament by fulfilling the great prophecies of his coming. The Old Testament, the culmination of its ceremonies, its types and figures are fulfilled in him. But most importantly, he came to fulfill the law by his perfect obedience. 
He came to fulfill all righteousness, which the law revealed and required. He came to mean more than our pattern or our example. He came for more than to explain the character of God's righteousness and the radical demands of the law. He came to be our righteousness. Romans 10, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Not that we can now ignore the law of God as irrelevant, but that now our acceptance with God is not through obedience to the law, but by faith, trust in Christ, who as righteousness and as righteous fulfilled all the law's righteous demands for us. So Jesus, glorious in his sinlessness, glorious in his holiness, in his purity of soul and life, in vain do we find a stain or shadow on the character of our blessed Redeemer. Glorious is what man should be in all his active and passive graces, the pattern of perfect human holiness, the living exemplar of what it means to fulfill all the law of God. Not only is Christ externally, eternally and perfectly righteous by virtue of his deity, but he was animated with righteousness throughout his earthly mission, and he will forever execute righteousness in his royal authority. Third, he is the victorious king. The Hebrew has a, a form of the verb to save, which can convey either a passive sense of being saved or delivered, or a stative sense of being victorious. That God's Messiah king is the object of divine help and deliverance is a recurring theme in Scripture, and it is attested throughout Christ's earthly experience. And the greatest deliverance of all was his deliverance from the grave by the power of God. The resurrection, the fulfillment of the promise made to the Old Testament fathers, the promise to bless the world through the descendant of Abraham could not be fulfilled if that descendant was dead. The resurrection established finally the identity of Jesus as the Son of God, vindicating the claims he made. The resurrection confirms who he is. And the resurrection validated Christ's atoning work, thus securing the believer's justification. The validation of the fact that the price for sin was paid in full was the resurrection. It's God's radical approval of Christ's work on our behalf. And so Christ's deliverance marked his victory over every enemy. And because he is victorious, he delivers and saves his people. Fourth, he is the humble king. This refers more than Christ's meekness of spirit. It has the idea of being afflicted or oppressed and encompasses the whole suffering life of Christ. Theologians often speak of Christ's earthly life as his humiliation. The keen riding a young donkey further defines his humble obedience and was the specific element of prophecy fulfilled at the triumphal entry. And the significance is not that the donkey was a lowly creature in contrast to the stately horse. Donkeys were often mounts of ro for royalty and rulers, the people's response when they saw Christ riding in Jerusalem on the donkey was not surprised as to why a king would be on a donkey, right? Rather, when they saw him, they immediately cried, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. The significance rests in the fact that horses were war machines, symbolic of self-reliant distrust of God. Remember, Deuteronomy said that the king was not to accumulate horses, it would be aberrant for the ideal king to associate himself with that which marked keenly disobedience. So even in the detail of the donkey, Christ fulfilled all righteousness. He is gentle and lowly. He comes unarmed, riding a donkey rather than a war host. He is the very opposite of the proud, oppressive tyrants that have all too often ruled the kingdoms and empires of this world. Fifth, he is the peace-preaching king. He will proclaim peace to the nations. We often think of peace as the absence of conflict. And the peace spoken of certainly includes that. For in announcing the arrival of this king, God promises he'll take away chariots and war horses. He'll remove the battle bow. But the, king, the peace the king proclaims is something far richer than this. It is shalom, wholeness, well-being, the sum total of everything good and life-enhancing. It encapsulates life in covenant with God, rich with his blessings. And the coming king is a preacher. And what he proclaims is peace with God and everything that flows from it. It's what Isaiah referred to as the good news, the gospel of peace. Jesus came to preach the gospel. When he was spending the early morning in prayer 
And his disciples found him and told him, Everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, Let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. Why did he come? He came to preach. He came as that greater prophet prophesied by Moses in Deuteronomy 18. Wherever we see him, he is preaching. We are not left in the dark as to the content of his preaching. Mark 1, 14-15, it's summarized. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He set forth the coming of the kingdom, the character of the kingdom, the conditions to enter the kingdom, the characteristics of the kingdom citizen. And by this preaching, he revealed that he was indeed the long-awaited Messiah. He came to preach the good tidings of life, to do the work of an evangelist, to show the way of peace, to proclaim deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. And his immediate calling is ours as well. His work is to be ours, to go up and down and publish the glad tidings of the gospel. We are to preach the good news. We have many responsibilities individually, in our families, and among ourselves. But in this world, we are to preach. That is the calling. Said the commentator Ryle, By preaching, the Church of Christ was first gathered together and founded. And by preaching, it has ever been maintained in health and prosperity. By preaching, sinners are awakened. By preaching, inquirers are led on. By preaching, saints are built up. By preaching, Christianity is carried to the heathen world. What are we to preach? The same message as our Lord. Repent and believe the good news. And then six, he is the global king. His dominion will extend from sea to sea. The king spoken of here is like no other. As Zion is like no other place. It's destined to be the center of God's kingdom on earth. And Zion's king is the one chosen by God to rule there over a kingdom that will eventually replace all others. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. And so this king differs from all other kings, both in the place from which he rules and in the extent of his rule. And taken all together, we see that he is both savior of his people and sovereign over all. So we have a most remarkable contrast here between war and peace, between the warrior God and the gentle king, between judgment and salvation. And yet it all comes together. God will triumph, but the king represents an alternative to being overthrown. He comes proclaiming peace. The king, so to speak, is God's final offer. It would be perilous indeed to spurn it. And all of this adds enormous depth and richness to our understanding of Jesus. God not only stood behind Jesus when he came, but was present in him. The coming of Jesus the Messiah was the coming of God himself, not at that time to overthrow his enemies, but to proclaim peace, to offer an amnesty. And he came first and foremost to Israel, his own people. He came to Jerusalem as God had said he would, riding on a donkey. He came to God's house, the temple, and he treated it as his own. And the tragedy is that when he came, his own people did not recognize him as their king. They did not know the day of God's coming to them, and they ended up crucifying him. Paul writes, none of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The ironic sign nailed to his cross said it all, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. But it was not the end of the story. For this tragedy, dark and terrible though it was, was within the plan and purpose of God to bring salvation, not just to Israel, but to the whole world. Not all rejected him. And around that crucified king gathered a new people of God who were destined to herald the good news of his kingdom to the ends of the earth. And that brings us to our third theme. God's enemies are both destroyed and delivered. God's king is both savior and sovereign. And finally, God's people are both conquerors and crowns. In this final section, the focus shifts from the king himself to those who are associated with him and share in his victory. And these verses highlight the transformation of Hebrew captives into God's warriors. First, God's people are delivered. Look at verse 11. As for you, because of the blood of your covenant, 
I will release your prisoners from the waterless cistern. Return to a stronghold, you prisoners who have hope. Today I declare that I will restore double to you. For I will bend Judah as my bow. I will fill that bow with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece. God's relationship with his people is spoken of here in terms of a covenant uh, sealed with blood. When a covenant was made in the ancient world, the cut-up animals symbolized what would happen, what should happen, to covenant breakers. This was a visual way for the parties to say, in effect, so shall my life be shed if I violate my promise. And the Lord appeals to the blood of his covenant with Israel as the grounds for their deliverance. This points back to the shedding of blood in God's covenant with Abraham and with Israel, and it also points forward to the shed blood of Christ, who on the night in which he was betrayed said, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. In fact, sacrifice is the only basis on which there can be any relationship at all between God and sinful humans. Hebrews 9.22, According to the law, Almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And this blood covenant is the ground of his promise. I will release your prisoners from the waterless cisterns. God's people would be set free from the waterless cistern, this dry well that could be used as a prison. You remember, Joseph's brothers threw him in one of these until they decided what they would do with him. And prophet Jeremiah describes our love affair with sin as this kind of prison. Jeremiah 2.12, My people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. A sinful state is a state of bondage. It's a pit in which there is no water, no life, no comfort. And we are all, by nature, prisoners in this pit. But through the precious blood of Christ, many prisoners have been set free from the horrible pit in which we would otherwise perish without hope or comfort. And so to be set free from the prison of a waterless cistern, it's not a release from political tyranny. Jesus said he would save his people from their sins so that they would no longer prefer filthy sludge over the living water. And when these words were written, many Israelites still lived in exile like prisoners in a waterless pit. But they're called upon to act as people who believe in the coming of God's king. They're to see themselves as citizens of Jerusalem, and therefore, by faith, of the Zion that is to be. God's promise is that they will have more, much more, than they have ever lost. They have only to shake off their despair and set out for home. Return to a stronghold, you prisoners who have hope. Today I declare that I will restore double to you. Zechariah envisions a day when God will restore twice as much to his people, a double portion, and recompense for the shame and suffering they had endured. That same promise is held out to all who turn to Christ, our great stronghold. In him, believers are safe from the wrath of God and the curse of the law. And to him, we must all turn in faith. We must flee to him and trust in his name under all trials and sufferings. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Now without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. There is no ultimate self-denial in following Christ. Deny yourself the cheap, unsatisfying, short-lived pleasures of sin, for the rich, satisfying, long-lasting pleasures of following your Savior, Sovereign Lord, Friend of sinners. So God's people are delivered, and then they are deployed. Verse 13, For I will bend Judah as my bow. I will fill that bow with Ephraim. I will rouse your son Zion against your son's Greece. He bends Judah like a bow, that's the old southern kingdom, and Ephraim, representing the old northern kingdom, He makes his arrows. So this speaks of a united people who through God's help overcome the world represented by Greece. And so when the Lord marches forth, the weapons of his warfare are his people. Here's an important corrective to passivity and indifference in the Christian life, to thinking you can just be a passenger in the church of Jesus Christ. 
God works sovereignly and omnipotently and freely. The Lord reigns and does whatever he pleases. And yet, he is pleased to work through his people, to use his people. The cosmic warfare of the kingdom of God with the kingdom of darkness rages around us every day. And we need to realize we are not civilian bystanders caught up in the conflict. We are combatants in the Lord's army. And certainly, the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and have prepared everything to take your stand. It's a call to arms. There's a war going on. Are you engaged on the front line? Or have you signed a truce? You are God's instruments. You are combatants in the Lord's army. In the spiritual conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Between the reign of grace and the perverse wickedness of the world. But we are not only deployed, we are also defended. Zechariah continues in verse 14. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will fly like lightning. The Lord God will sound the ram's horn and advance with the southern storms. The Lord of armies will defend them. They will consume and conquer with sling stones. They will drink and be rowdy as if with wine. They will be full, as full as a sprinkling basin, like those at the corners of the altar. The Lord came as a king of peace, and yet for their oppressors, he will one day appear as the divine warrior, sounding the bugle to advance against them, consuming and conquering, pouring out blood in abundance, and the Lord will defend his people. Nothing in all the world, not even death itself, can overcome his defense. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Brothers and sisters, we who have Jesus as our king will have God as our champion. We will have battles to fight, but God will be with us and fight for us. And the fighting will not last forever. There is a day coming when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and our king will come again. No longer riding a donkey, but on the white war horse. He will conquer his enemies once and for all, including the last enemy, death itself. On that day, he will set all of the prisoners of hope free. The king is coming. Blessed indeed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in the meantime, as we live in a world of waterless pits and hostile foes, we wait for this glorious appearing with confident hope. Jesus will come again. He will bring about our full salvation, the final establishment of his kingdom and all its glory. God will one day set all things right. One day it will all be over. The time of grain and new wine will have come. The time of harvest festival, paradise restored. That is the heritage of God's people. And our blessed hope that should always inspire us to faithful service. So God's people are delivered, deployed, and defended as conquerors. But more than that, they will also be displayed as crowns. Look at verses 16 through 17. The Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. For they are like jewels in a crown, sparkling over his land. How lovely and beautiful. Grain will make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. By destroying our enemies, the Lord will rescue his people and shepherd his flock forever. We will be the jewels of his crown, his beautiful and treasured possession. We'll never again go hungry and thirsty. We'll receive the blessings of grain and new wine. And so when God saves his people, we become to him like jewels of a crown. Isn't that beautiful? Jewels in his crown, shining on his land. Interestingly, the Garden of Eden contained jewels, and so will the new Eden, the jewels being God's own people. 
Now, don't misunderstand here. The point is not that God will make much of us. It's not so much that we become diamonds that he's just got to have. You're so beautiful. Look at you. It's that we come to display his beauty, to manifest his majesty. We become adornments reflecting to the world the beauty and holiness and wisdom and grace and unity and love of our God. The church displays God's glory and makes his greatness known. That's what we are delivered and deployed for. So we see that God's coming will subdue his enemies through his king for his people. And that means two things as we close. First, it means if we're not Christians this morning, Zechariah has told us about coming judgment. And yet he's also told us about an offer of mercy, about a way of escape, about the possibility of deliverance. In verses 9 to 10, we find out how it can be yours. It can be yours by faith in the king who came to Zion to die for sinners, to shed his blood of the covenant, to make you his. So flee from the waterless prison of sin. Trust in Christ. He will deliver you. And secondly, if we're Christians, Zechariah is calling us to participate in the Lord's conquest of the nations. And yet in verses 9 and 10, we learn the manner of that conquest. It is to be constrained by the pattern of our Savior's conquest. How did he win the victory? How did he triumph over the rulers and authorities and principalities and powers? He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had become as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He wins, he reigns, he triumphs. How? By taking the servant posture and by giving himself for others. How do we participate in the conquest of the Savior that he is procuring through the gospel in the world? We do it the way he did, by taking the servant posture, by coming in humility and giving ourselves for others. Our weapons are not carnal, but spiritual. It's not by boycotts and lobby groups and political action that the kingdom of God advances. It is by selfless sacrifice, by loving service, and by gospel witness in the mold and pattern of the crucified Lord. The Lord Jesus will use his people as his weapons, but every one of those weapons is cross-shaped. Our lives are to bear the imprint of likeness to the Savior who gave himself for us. We are to go and give ourselves for others. And we know that one day it will be worth it all. One day Jesus will come again and subdue all his enemies, for the everlasting joy of his people. One day, all the precious jewels, all God's people from every nation on earth will adorn Emmanuel's land, will shine in Jesus' glorious blood-bought crown, and Christ will exclaim of his magnificent bride, how lovely and beautiful. Let's pray together. Our Father, we praise you for the Lord Jesus, who by the blood of his covenant has purchased for himself a people from every tribe and language and nation, so that Philistines might be as a clan in Judah, and Ekron like the Jebusites, and we who were once aliens and strangers and foreigners to your people may now be the people of God, grafted in by your grace. As we see our Savior's selfless sacrifice, as we hear the call to arms and to labor in the conquest of the nations, For the gospel ourselves, help us to follow the model, the pattern of our Savior has set, to give ourselves for the good of those around us. Lord, if there are any here today who has not become, as it were, a jewel in Christ's crown, we ask that you would save them on this day, free them from their captivity to sin, and deploy them in the sacred cause of advancing your gospel for the joy of your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.